welcome everyone to the uh, writing a game boy emulator in ocaml uh, by lin we're glad dean can join us today so yeah without further delay over to you lin hi everyone um, i am lino shitani and today i'm going to yeah talk about writing a game boy emulator in ocaml so yeah have you ever felt like this when learning a new programming language so you can write simple program snippets and you but you don't know how to write like medium to large scale code or you have studied advanced lang advanced language features and have a rough understanding of how they work but you don't know how to use them in practice so this is exactly how i felt when i started learning ocaml and this is how i felt so here is me as a beginner like reading books writing ocaml as a hobby and running very simple programs and then i look around and like around i see these intermediary to pro people who are like writing ocaml as a job and like contributing to open source software and i felt like i can't reach the other side by continuing down the current path so this i gap i call the intermediate valley so what should i do and i thought okay let's work on a project to gain practical experience let's write a game boy emulator so this is what what i wrote it's called camel boy and it is a game boy emulator written in on camel and it's compiled to javascript using js of on camel library so it runs in a browser like this and here is a plot story and implementing camel boy helped me overcome the intermediate valley that i'm mentioned before and this presentation aims to share that experience okay so why a game boy emulator one thing nice about a game boy emulator is that the specifications are clear there's no need to think about what to implement in a sense i think it's similar to lead code because in lead code you have test cases and you write code and if the test cases pass all good Similarly, for Game Boy emulators, you have Game Boy cartridges that you want to run, and either you're able to run them or not able to run them. So, like what you have to implement is very, very clear. Furthermore, Game Boy emulators they're like a good medium to large scale like project. And here, when I say medium to large scale project, is like code that is difficult to de develop without tests, and therefore need to be designed in a way that makes te writing tests easy. Furthermore, I have like emotional attachment to Game Boys. So I have fond memory of waiting until my family is sound asleep and then hiding under the covers and playing Pokemon on my Game Boy Lite. Okay, let's look at how the implementation. But before that, like what are emulators anyway? And okay, this is what uh, like first like games Game Boy hardware works. Like first in the cartridge, you have machine code, and uh, this machine code is fed as an input to the hardware. Now the hardware will like process the machine code and then have an output. The output will be a screen or like sound and so on. So what is emulators? Emulators is like you take the exact same machine code, but instead of feeding it to hardware, you feed it to a software. The software will like output the, the screen and the sound. So because this software emulates what the hardware does, it's called an emulator. Here is the architecture of Camel Boy. The Camel Boy first it has a CPU and within the CPU, you have a bunch of registers. And then you have a bunch of IO devices like RAM, timer, joypad, cartridge, GPU, serial port. And sitting in between, you have a bus. So what the bus does is it's like a mediator of connecting the CPU and IO devices. So for example, like if the CPU is reading to this address range, then the read will be routed to the cartridge. And then you can read data from the cartridge. Similarly, if you read and write to this address range, then you'll be reading, the bus will route those read and write to the RAM 
and then the read and writing. And then you can read and write data to the memory. And for example, if you write to this specific address, then you're connected to the timer, and then you can change the timer speed. OK, how did I go on and implement this? The first attempt of impl implementing the CPU and bus module is this. First, I implement a CPU module. Within the CPU module, I have a reference to the bus module. And when I want to like read and write to the bus, I call the bus.read or bus.write with an address that I want to read and write to. And I have the bus like module, and the bus module will have like references to cartridge RAM and so on and so forth. And when I call bus.read or bus.write, it will route the read and write to the appropriate IO device. However, like this implementation, it turned out to be problematic. And the pro problem is that like the CPU, bus cartridge, and like the like all the IO devices is all tightly coupled and cannot be tested separately. What I mean by this is that the CPU module has a concrete reference to the bus module. And the bus module has concrete reference to the cartridge and RAM and so on. So, so it, everything is tightly coupled and it's very hard to test. Because like to test the CPU, I have to implement the bus. But to test the bus, uh, to implement the bus, I have to implement all the IO devices. So I cannot just simply test the CPU in this case. Okay, at this point, I remembered, hey, there was a functionality called functors in OCaml. Maybe I can use this here. And what functors means in OCaml is that it's functions that take, takes a module and returns a module. So how can this be used? The solution was to use functors to make the CPU rely on the interface of the bus instead of the implementation. So here, like I have defined a bus interface. So the bus interface will be like an interface that has a read and a write that pass an address and you can read values from it. Now, like the CPU, it is no longer a simple module, it is a functor. So it will take a module and return a module. And the module that it takes is any module that satisfies the bus interface. And then it will take a module that satisfies the bus interface, and then it will have a reference to that, and then we'll call reads and writes for this bus. Now the bus interface can have multiple implementations, like the bus.ml, which is like the actual bus module. But you can have, also have a mock bus implementation, which is like simply uh, does not connect to the actual I.O. devices and just like implements a very simple read and write functionality. Now by having this, uh, by making the CPU a, a functor, in the unit tests of the CPU, I can insert a mock implementation of the bus. So what it's, so in the test cpu.ml, when I instantiate the CPU, I can call the functor and then pass in the mock bus implementation and then go on and test the CPU without worrying about the implementation of the bus or the IO devices. Okay, here I have a learning. The learning is that by using functors, it allows you to write loosely coupled testable code that depends on interfaces rather than implementation. So this was my learning. Okay, let's look into the implementation of the CPU in more detail. So in Game Boy, the CPU has 8-bit registers and 16-bit registers. And I implemented through this register module. And the type will have, in, and then it defines 8-bit register identifiers through the type R. And it also defines the 16-bit register identifier through type RR. And then you have read and write for both of these registers. In the 8-bit case, you return a U and date, which is an 8-bit value. And in the 16-bit register case, you take the 16-bit register, and then you can read and write 16-bit values. And furthermore, the instruction set also includes 8-bit instructions and 16-bit instructions. And for example, if you take add, 
add will have two, add eight and add 16. So two variants of add. One will take an 8-bit register and an 8-bit value and add it and store it to the 8-bit register. And 16-bit version, you also take a 16-bit register and a 16-bit value and store it to the 16-bit register. Okay, how should we go about and defining this instruction set? So this was my first approach of the implementation. So in the instruction.ml, I define the instruction set here. So this is the, the type of the instruction set in variants. And now I have add eight and add 16, so both the eight bit variant and 16 bit variant of the add function. And both of these functions will take two arguments as you've seen here, like you take two arguments. And each of the arguments, it can be like a 8-bit register, it can be a 16-bit register, it can be an 8-bit value, or it can be a 16-bit value, and so on. Now this all seems nice, but actually this does not work. Now why does it not work? So actually like we get stuck in the execution function of the instruction. So here is an execution function. It takes an instruction and executes it. And the instruction will, internally, it will match against the instruction. And if it's add eight, it will like do an eight bit add after reading the argument of like both of these arguments. And the read argument function will take an argument. And then if it's a eight bit register, it will call read R, which will return an eight bit value. And if it's a 16 bit register, it will return a 16, read a 16 bit value and return. Okay. But like the problem is that you actually get stuck here. And you get stuck because the return value differs by constructor you match. Hence, you cannot type the whole function. So here like, is a read arg function, like extract it out. And what is the return type of this function? You take an argument, and then you match against the argument. And if it's an 8-bit register, you return an 8-bit value. And a 16-bit register, you return a 16-bit value. Now, like, what should a return type be? Because, like, based on the type you you match, like, the return value is different. So this function is not well typed. Okay, at this point, I remember, hey, there was something called GADTs that I like read about when I was learning OCaml, but I quite didn't really get. But maybe I can use that here. And uh, yeah, so the solution was actually to use GADTs. And here is the instruction set that uses GADTs. The type T is the same, but the arguments, they're defined in a different way using GADTs. Now it looks pretty different from the variant case, specifically like this part. Like what does this actually mean? Okay, so the left-hand side of this arrow of the GADT case, it actually corresponds to the part after of in the variance. So R of register dot R, it serves the same purpose. And namely, it's a value that you get when you match with the constructor. So you, when you call read arg and you match against the r, then this, this variable r is actually like the 8-bit register like uh, value. And if it's, you match against the rr, the value that you get is a register rr with a 16-bit register. So the value you get on the, each of these match cases like it's different and it's defined here. Okay, but that's all good. But what about this part? Like the right hand side of the arrow, like there's nothing equivalent in the variant case there. Okay, so the right hand side of the arrow, the value you return, it actually means the value re you return when you match with the constructor. What does this mean? Like, and when you match with the read arg function, when you match with a 8-bit register, the value return will be uint8. This is what it's, this is like expressing. And when you match with the rr case, you return a 16-bit value. So this is parameterizing the return value of the match cases. So here I have a learning. Like variants can parameterize with the values we get when you match a state in the match statement. And GATs also let you parameterize the type of value you, you return in the match statement. So it's a more generalized version of variance, which is why I think it's called generalized abstract data types. And by using GAT 
DTs, like an implement execute function that I described before. And like each of these cases, it will return a different value. But because the argument type is defined as a TADT, it can be well typed. OK, now here's a quick summary. So like throughout this whole process of writing Camel Boy, I went through this, this whole cycle and this whole cycle many times. So first, I would be studying books and documents. I like kind of understand the core concept, but like I don't fully understand it. At least I feel like so. Then I go on and implement something, so like specific parts of Camel Boy. Then I face a problem. Then at this point, I kind of remember, hey, when I study, was studying, there was this feature. Maybe I can use that. And then I implement a solution using that feature. And then like at this point, I truly understand the concept that I was like studying here. And this whole like cycle, it was not only to understand the language feature, but also like test frameworks, build system, and libraries, all in a similar way. Like I would go through this cycle. Okay, conclusion. So as I mentioned before, I was struggling with it intermediate valley as a beginner. And how to overcome this valley? Like how do you become an intermediary or pro like OCamler? And I think the only way is to write a middle scale project and repeat the cycle of problem and solution, as I mentioned before. I think this is the only way you can actually get proficient in a language. And for me, that middle scale project was Camel Boy. But there are probably other projects that can like do the similar role. And I have three recommended criteria when choosing such project. One will be that it has to be moderately complex. So this is because certain problems like testability, maintainability only arise when you reach a certain level of complexity. Furthermore, it sh the project should be complex enough that, so that you are not confident to pull it off because you only grow by doing things that you feel, you feel uncomfortable doing. Also, it's nice when the project has clear specifications because it's tough enough to figure out what to write and how to, uh, it's tough to figure out what to write and how to write at the same time. So let's like keep the what part, like outsource the specification and focus on the how. Furthermore, like having clear goals makes things like much easier to progress. Like for example, for me, it was like running Pokemon on my own emulator. That's a very clear goal. Furthermore, it, the project should be fun. Like, for example, for me, like I spend easily like hours test playing Camel Boy, like just playing various games that I used to play as a child. And some examples of such projects would be, for example, game emulators like Game Boy NES Chip 8, compilers, or a subset of existing languages. Operating system, like some simple version of them, or a network protocol, for example, TCP IP, I think those would be fun too. And here's a quick epilogue. Like after writing Camel Boy, I actually landed a job of writing OCaml professionally. And Camel Boy played a big part of it because like the people who were interviewing me, they knew about Camel Boy. So extra benefit of doing your personal like middle scale project is that it might help you get a job. That is it. Here's some links of a blog, a blog article version of this whole talk. It's a repository of Camel Boy. I have also have a QR code, so go take a look. And here's my Twitter. Like, if you have any feedback or questions, reach out there. Okay, that's it. Hey, Lin. Uh, yeah, that was a really great presentation. You can even check out chat. Uh, it seems people have really enjoyed that. Oh, uh, and yeah, thanks, Lin, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, with us today. Thanks everyone.